Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. Are you spoiled by metal? Meaning, do you love listening to songs that are over three and a half minutes long? If yes, today's video is going to be perfect for you, which is not surprising at all because many of you have been recommending it for quite some time. Sweet Sister Mary by Queensryche clocks in at just over 10 minutes, so you can imagine today's analysis video is going to be much longer than that. Let's get to it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this intro, which is full of tons of fascinating sounds. I appreciate the way they're really setting the environment. Of course, you have the rain in the background. We had some very creepy noises kind of early on as well. I don't know uh, what all was making those sounds, probably synthesizers, but I'm really not sure. This choir is very interesting. It's definitely, um, it feels very dogmatic and I think I'm, I'm taking that partly from my background knowledge now in the overall album. So this is coming from Operation Mind Crime which is a concept album I think it was released in 1988 by Queensryche and it has a very long story that goes through it. Uh, at this point I think the main character is um, already sort of been drawn into and manipulated by uh, an organization, kind of revolutionist organization. And uh, you can tell that he's starting to crack. Um, by the end, he's in a mental institution, uh, has killed people, uh, is addicted to drugs. So um, I, at the very beginning, you can feel that atmosphere of um, it being creepy and kind of dark, which I think they've set really well. And then additionally, uh, the choir feeling so dogmatic to me feels like it might be uh, rather cultish. Even in the harmonies, they're keeping it fairly static. It sounds like um, there's not a lot of movement in the voices, essentially. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. There we go. So right in there in the choir harmonies when I was talking about static, if you specifically are listening to the bottom female voice, which is the alto voice, you listen to that voice and notice where it moves or it doesn't, um, you'll notice that I think the altos have stayed on one note the entire time so far. Um, very, very, very static. The other voices are moving, but they're not big leaps that are happening, they're stepwise motion. Um, the sense of feel very gothic in nature, essentially. Um, and I, it, it isn't uncommon for altos to not have as much movement that there's actually a hilarious song called Lament or Altos Lament that talks about how um, altos essentially never get to have big glorious melodies. But this much lack of movement is very notable, noticeable. So I'll go back just a little more, listen to that.
Hmm. It's also um, not very legato. It's very stabby, very direct. Like there's almost accents or even a staccato mark with a, possibly a stress mark on top of it. So you get this kind of pounding. Again, that makes me think dogmatic in nature. <laughs> This um, this vocal entrance uh, just gives me shivers throughout. It's totally stunning. Uh, the there's a particular part in here where I, I feel like the stun hit me the most. Uh, that was in these half steps that Jeff Tate is singing, and he they're so legato and and creepy and. Um, they have this like weird longing in them at the same time. Uh, a half step is a, an interval that is the closest interval um, that you can sing in a normal Western scale. So um, often those two notes are so close to each other. If, you, if you're going back and forth between them or playing them together, they're very dissonant. Um, so a lot of times they'll be used in something that's creepy. Um, it's the it's like the sound waves are just close enough that they end up really rubbing badly against each other essentially um, a little bit further oh. <laughs> <sighs> I also love uh, he's keeping the dynamic or the volume overall very quiet right now, um, even to the point of having whisper talk essentially at, with both um, 10 p.m. his opening words and uh, also this last line that he said here, it's whisper talk, almost had a little growl and there would be a little false fold action. And uh, the, keeping that dynamic quiet right now, it really draws us in, not to mention his excellent enunciation draws us in, but it draws us in and allows him to go somewhere else with the story. I'm going to go back one more time just because this half step section is so glorious. <laughs> A stellar instrument. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, um, he's saying they're mine with the last word. And I think that makes sense because he's essentially, I think, having to assassinate people for this weird cultish organization that he's gotten entwined in. Uh, anyhow, so they're mine. I think those are the people that he's assassinated. Creepy slide. Siren, not just a slide. Yeah. 
I should mention there is a woman that plays Sweet Sister Mary, or just Sister Mary, and this uh, pa Pamela Moore, and it'll be my first time ever hearing her. I'm guessing she's the one we're hearing speaking on the screen right now. Um, I love that we have that half step uh, figure, like almost like a motif that's coming back. It's a little bit different here than before, but it came back, especially when he was saying Sister Mary. And I think that um, is tapping into the longing that I heard in the very first time he was singing that half step uh, piece as well. Uh, it's really, really cool. I love the way he sounds, he sounds a little bit mad like like it has a little craziness that's overtaken him at this point and I'm trying to pinpoint exactly all of the ways that that's coming out uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit let's go back and listen again to this section here yeah it's a cool transition to that one I think that sometimes it's when he has a more hollow tone quality that has less vibrato and we'll get the feeling of madness in that. Um, obviously sometimes switching between the speaking and singing, we get a little bit of that as well. Um, I'll keep going on, I'll keep pointing out little bits of what makes him seem like he's just a little bit unhinged. It's, it's fun to look for all of those spots. Okay, let's keep going. I really dig this kind of music that essentially is progressive and it, it tells a story as you move through it. Uh, I think it's really important when you're writing this kind of music that you have uh, transitions that make sense, that really easily flow into the next one. I really liked this one. It had a good flow, but you can feel that the energy is ramping up, right? We have a lot more percussive activity in particular. Uh, in addition, I think it's really important when you have progressive music that you have something that the audience can hook on to. It can be a little difficult otherwise for first time listeners. So uh, a lot of, there's been studies that are kind of interesting about uh, brains and how we really like repetition. So a lot of brains just say, okay, I would like to have a verse and lots of choruses that are the same thing I've heard before because I like choruses and maybe a little tiny difference there and then I'll be excited about the difference. Um, with progressive music, it's more like we're going to take you on this big, long journey. We're going to be somewhere totally different by the end. There's going to be chapters in it. And uh, and having little moments like those half-step moments where you have figures that relate to a part that was earlier in the piece. And you essentially hear the evolution of a song. Uh, it's important to have all of that contained. It's very difficult to write. Uh, but all of that relates to the title of the song, which is Sweet Sister Mary. Sweet as in not S-W-E-E-T, but S-U-I-T-E. I think that's so cool <laughs> because I think about a musical suite, like a very large musical work that would have different movements in it. Um, but I also think maybe just a suite that you would stay in that has lots of rooms or something. So I feel like right at this moment, we just moved into the next musical room. And I think it's so clever of them to name it this. Okay. <laughs>
I will listen to you in a bit, new person. Um, but who? <sighs> Jeff Tate is just a vocal god. He, the way he had this beautiful, subtle entrance, the quietness in it, and then suddenly breaks out into just consistent power here. And it also sounds pained at times. And there's endurance that you have to talk about as well, the way he's singing so high with so much power consistently. Uh, and the way he's moving his body too, it backs up how he's singing. He's very involved and you can tell that he's emotional in his movements. Uh, sometimes people get into a recording booth and I don't, you might have done this too, or they get in front of a camera and they suddenly get really stiff as if, oh, I can't be very expressive at all, right? Uh, or I shouldn't move. Somebody told me I shouldn't move. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. There might be little things or ticks that you might have. Um, we'll get over them, okay? Get over them together. What you do is you go into a recording booth and you move your hands everywhere because that increases your vocal expression. It actually sends more signals to your brain, which sends signals to your vocal folds to be more expressive. So uh, what he's doing here with his body and the way his movements are expressing desire at one point and frustration and um, you can tell he's torn. That's amazing for bringing more vocal expression to the piece as well, as long as you tie it in, tie it in really well to your vocal support so you still have good techniques, which I'll talk about later. Uh, it's really cool to see uh, the way I, he's wrapped up in this emotionally. Okay, Ooh, ha. here, let's try here. Pamela uh, has some things in her voice that I find very similar to Jeff's voice, uh, which I think is a good balance. They're also singing in a very similar range, which is crazy. Jeff Tate's voice goes crazy high. And they've got a certain leanness to their sound in that same area, which is pretty awesome to hear. She definitely has uh, a nice focus on the sound. And they both have this thing that when they go up a little it's like almost like a crack higher that they'll do, but it's more like a little squeak in a good way <laughs> that they, they have in both of their voices. I'm gonna go back over time. Too far, sorry. Who's that speaking in? I, first of all, was just watching the movement and thinking about the support and how he's doing such a good job of that. But at the end, this caught me, it really caught me by surprise. He, he has this tenderness and it sounds like, 
and exhaling a moment of giving up at the end of this section. And it, it basically sounds to me like there's so much more air he suddenly allows to move through the system. Most of the time, if you're going to be singing with this kind of sustained loudness, um, the you're often going to have a lot of breath support that's centered very, very low and is restraining the breath flow from just poofing out all of a sudden. So you've got a, instead of a very steady, consistent, energetic stream of air, and instead of just a whoosh out. So I think you might've heard me talk before about putting your feet in the ground or spreading them out on the stage and almost feeling like the energy is coming from beneath the stage. That's really useful. Truthfully, uh, that energy or that breast support goes all the way down to your pelvic floor. It's very, very, very low. And uh, right at this ending point, suddenly it sounded like the support system, uh, it almost like melted and he let all of that air whoosh and bring out this feeling of giving up, like he's uh, giving in and asking, like supplicating, um, asking for her forgiveness in some way. This this last, I'll show you it in here. It's stunning. Right there, this, he has a lot more airflow coming out and it's just super, super, super gorgeous. Um, oh, another really interesting thing, you're seeing he's on his knees a lot and I think it's partly right here is where we get a curve back. Most of the time when he's been on his knees, he's had a fairly straight torso. That posture is super important for singing, really, really important. And most of the, the time, um, we can even go back a little bit. See, his posture is pretty good. He never bends very much while he's singing. A little bit there, a little bit in the top, but not down here. Oh, and then let's, right, at, right when he finishes singing, you see the posture completely crumble there. Um, he's been very good uh, with keeping that support system engaged while he's on his knees. It's very important when you're on stage, if you are going to be really active or laying on the stage in weird positions, which uh, for some reason, <laughs> a lot of times opera directors want that. So you have to figure out how to sing on while lying on your side and, and still support well. So when you're on your knees like this, if you really think about still maintaining a long torso, especially down um, in the lower torso, um, that'll help you to not collapse your air support. So when he's collapsing, he'll do a little bit in, in this area, but uh, he, it doesn't continue all the way down his torso. You see that he's still maintaining really, really nice breath support. Oh, <laughs> these lyrics are intense. Um, I think Mary is a really interesting character just from what I know about her from reading about the concept album. Uh, I believe she's a prostitute turned nun, but supplies him with drugs. So you've got some conflicting things in there. And of course, uh, Jeff Tate's character is, seems obsessed in love with Mary at the same time. <sighs> It, and of course, these uh, these words, burn my thighs, spread in sacrificial, right? Whew, steamy lyrics, right? Incredibly steamy. So you get, I get this conflict that's happening um, between the, the nun and there at the same time. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, one other thing, I really, really like her mouth shapes. Look at that mouth shape. It's so good. She tends to have a very high back of her tongue when she's singing, which tells me she's not having a lot of tongue root tension. So her tongue isn't depressing her larynx and, uh, opening up of the mouth is, you know, much wider. It actually kind of looks like, uh, very reminiscent of Pavarotti's uh, mouth shape. So yeah. <laughs> nice.
again, really interesting to watch his torso with his, uh, when he's singing and the knees in support. Um, I love the harmonies in that section. Really, really nice. I like the way that they weren't always continuous. It's that they had moments when they sang together. It seemed like those moments were really well coordinated with the lyrics that they'd chosen to. That section was insane. Uh, the lots of pitch bending in there, and the way that uh, the sounds from the voices uh, definitely um, sounded pressed, uh, disturbed slash uh, maybe I don't know. There's there's different possibilities there, um, but definitely evoking a lot of emotion. This is a really cool journey throughout this song. I I am digging the storytelling. I really love the visuals with it too. It I feel like we're in a movie and uh but instead of the lead being the visual of the movie, so what your eyes see, the lead is the audio, it's what your ears hear. And we get sprinkles in from the visuals that assist in the telling of the story. And it's almost like the reverse of a film where you get sprinkles into the audio to assist in telling the story. This is the audio is the main story and the visuals are the extra sprinkles. It's really cool. I think that's the same motive from the first Entrance? Maybe. It just feels very Mozart to me. I feel like we're having a DSEA kind of moment from Mozart's Requiem. Um, the the It's an end of days feeling. Um, definitely with, it's great that they have um, this in Latin. Definitely harkens back to masses and that a Requiem mass, especially for end of times. Really cool. Um, very interesting to hear the way the choir is interspersed with the instruments, the gaps in between um, make me wonder visually uh, as, as, as the story is progressing, what should our mind be filling in during those gaps? What's happening? It makes me, it really feels like there's a specific story that they had in mind when composing this. And I want to understand more what that might have been.
Um, so the madness that I was talking about, you can hear it in here in a very specific way. Sometimes he has phrases that are much shorter uh, or words that are much shorter. And it's not a normal cadence for how a person speaks or sings. And then he'll have phrases that are much longer. Um, so you get this jagged uh, inserts, sort of like a madman talking. Uh, and that's uh, that's another way that he's got the little bit of madness there, of course, with some of those slides too. Uh, really, really cool. I love the way they also hearken back to that. Uh, another section in the piece with some of these riffs, uh, you definitely get an idea of movements in the song that we're going through. Okay, I'm uh, going to go back just a little bit to see if you can pick up on that. Um, the way he has the like, hits in the middle and then long phrases, it's cool. the pleading in her voice here. Uh, I think her, the words are just so powerful. Don't don't turn your back on my disgrace. The blood of Christ can't feel my wounds so deep, right? It's, um, it, it really does tell a clear story of, um, you know, her as the prostitute now moving to the, the nun, trying to um, maybe change the route in life that she's, she's been on. And uh, and of course, I believe he ends up killing her. I want to say at the end of the song. I'm not sure exactly where in the album that happens. But I think it's after or maybe at the end of the song. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, let's go back to her portion right here again. <laughs> go back a little bit and figure out what these phrases are they're singing together. It seems like they're very specific reasons they've chosen these words. Oh, no. It's interesting. She's she joins on Lady of Pain, Alone, Search for the Truth, Myself and You, Lives. Um, so it seems like she's singing on things that are relating directly to her. Um, she, of course, she isn't saying I see myself in you, um, because we wouldn't have the same person saying I there. Um, so it's. I just think it's really well crafted which notes they've come together on and um and the description of it too. It's so it's so interesting. We could go really much deeper into this. It's
feel like we have uh, a, another version of Bruce Dickinson on stage, the way he's running around and so physically encompassing his character. This also reminds me of Maynard in Tools Sober, right? Um, that, <laughs> it, that he's so in his character. Uh, very, very curious that the last line that he's saying here is your mind. And he said that earlier in the lyrics when I think when referring to people that he'd assassinated, I think that was my interpretation at the time. I might be wrong, but just really curious that the same line came up right here. Um, and then he's essentially destroyed, like maybe whatever happened between them just completely left him devastated. <laughs> Choral composition is so intriguing in there. I I think that they're saying Dies Irae. I think that they actually are referring to that Latin um, uh, sort of end of days requiem bit, uh, but it is so short in the choir voices, um, in the lower one at least. There's some upper ones that are sustaining. It's short to the point of almost being a little spoken and just very, very harsh. Um, not normal choral writing at all. Such a fascinating end to this song. I love the way that they essentially tied it up by taking us back into that ambiance with the rain and the lightning and this red light, which I think probably is representative of some kind of violence. And I love the storytelling overall. We really have a journey that we went through with the lyrics, with the vocal incredibleness <laughs> of Jeff Tate for sure. I love the way that Pamela matched him as well. And I just am in total awe of how committed and in that character Jeff Tate was. His body movements and the way that he still was supporting his voice throughout were astonishing, really, really amazing. If you'd like to hear more analysis of songs like this, you can check out this playlist over here. Got some extra prog in there. Uh, more Queen's Reich, of course, a little bit of tool, some good stuff. And I hope that I'll see you again in another video soon. Thank you so much.